Hello and welcome. You're watching Big Picture with me, Vishal Dahiya. And today we're going to talk about the need for reforms in multilateral institutions. In fact, uh, recently the foreign ministers of uh, BRICS nations uh, held a meeting where all of them agreed and a joint statement was also issued about uh, the need for reforms in most of these multilateral institutions uh, such as United Nations, uh, WTO, World Bank, IMF and WHO as well. We'll try and figure out because there have been a lot of talk about uh, reforms in the United Nations and various uh, of its organizations. The concept or the idea of reforms in these organizations, why are these reforms required and how can these reforms be brought about and what kind of reforms are we talking about here. So for more on this, we're joined by two distinguished experts. Let me first uh, introduce them to you, beginning with Professor Harshvi Pant, who is here with us. Uh, he is head of the Strategic Studies uh, Program at ORF. We also have with us uh, Ambassador Dalip Sinha. He is a former permanent representative uh, of India with the United Nations. Welcome, both of you gentlemen. Let me begin with you, uh, uh, Ambassador Sinha, because you've been there uh, as India's permanent representative, let's try and understand, you know, uh, the, the kind, uh, the way these multilateral institutions have been functioning so far and the lacunas therein, which we have identified over the time, which have led us to, uh, you know, this conclusion that reforms are required now. You know, Vishal, the, the idea that multilateral organizations require reforms is a fairly old one. If you recall, in the earlier days, we talked about an international uh, economic order, new international information order. We've been talking about reform of the Security Council now for 30 years uh, because most of these organizations have suffered from certain problems. Security Council, we all know about. It has five uh, permanent members and the others are elected on a two-year term. So we feel that there should be greater representation uh, in the security issue. For example, uh, half the peacekeeping missions are located in Africa and no African country is a permanent member of the Security Council. Uh, India, with its large uh, economy, large population, goes unrepresented in the Security Council on a permanent basis. So uh, that need for the reform in that sector has been well established. But mm -hmm. uh, reform in the trade sector, for example, we have, we have talked about from earlier days how trade conditions need to be improved for developing countries so that their uh, terms of trade are better. The global financial system needs reform because uh, Financial flows have been uh, troubling uh, countries, especially the VK economies. So these are ideas that have been there. And the whole general idea of promoting a multipolar world uh, has also been there, that the world should not be confined to just earlier it was two poles. Now, again, we seem to be moving towards a, a bipolar world. Uh, but we'll come to that later uh, as we move. But the fact that there is need for reform of the uh, international order in all its aspects, finance, security, uh, trade, uh, has been there from, from a fairly long time. And it has acquired a great deal of urgency in, recent, in the recent past because many of the countries like uh, India have emerged and they are major economies now in the world and they want to play a greater role. Okay, okay. That brings us uh, to uh, the, uh, you know, uh, other aspect of it all. And let me bring in uh, Professor Pant here as well. Professor Pant, as Mr. Sinai is pointing out, uh, you know, and this is quite... Uh, Significant here as well, uh, you know, the BRICS foreign ministers uh, in uh, issuing a joint statement there. We've been talking about reforms in the United Nations for quite some time now. And then all of us are aware of the nuances there, as well as uh, the areas which require, uh, you know, the reforms. But the question, the big question is where to begin? Uh, yes, uh, Vishal, big question, and I think uh, a question that we are yet to find uh, an answer for. Uh, and I think the challenge here is that, look, what are we aiming for? Because this is a particularly devastating time for multilateralism. The fact that BRICS itself is talking of multilateral reforms, where BRICS, it, you know, the creation of BRICS was a reflection with the dissatisfaction of the multilateral order. So successive BRICS declarations talk about reforms of the multilateral system because these powers were dissatisfied with the status quo and they've been talking about reforms. Now, some powers, I mean, even in BRICS, or not all powers are equal. So China and Russia have a permanent representation in the UN Security Council. India does not. But I think the challenge here is that Today, when you look at the multilateral order, you're looking at an order that is crippling under the weight of its own contradictions, uh, whether it is United Nations Secur Security Council or WHO. 
we all talk of covid 19 and how uh, catastrophic this it has been but where did it all start it began with lack of transparency from one particular country and inability of a of a platform like who to manage it uh, in the initial phase had it done a good job in the initial phase we would not perhaps be facing this problem mm -hmm. so uh, and look at the world trade organization you know countries are competing there uh, with with different visions so what we are looking at is is a very you know strange site where on both ends at both ends of the spectrum you have a challenge you have a rising power like china that is challenging the fundamental norms and ch fundamental ideas of global order you have on the other hand a country like america especially till uh, till mr trump was there was withdrawing from the global in, uh, multilateral order now mr biden is saying we are back but i i don't think it's clear uh, you know um, what kind of uh, multilateral system uh, are they aiming for because clearly the contradictions are very very huge mm -hmm. so where do you begin is there a, is there a consensus uh, certainly there is consensus that reforms are needed and it's it's very simple because any multilateral order is based on a certain kind of an international structure this in, uh, you know multilateral order is based on post 1945 structure so clearly we need reforms new powers have risen new ideas have, are on the table new issues are on the table but where do you begin mm -hmm. are, are all countries on the same page when we even within brics are we on the same page for example it's not entirely evident to me that the chinese want india the UN, as a permanent member of the un security council so i think the question is how do we generate this consensus that takes us beyond this question of reforms we all want reforms reforms are needed unless reforms are uh, undertaken we will find a proliferation of minilaterals that we are witnessing today uh, it can be brics on one hand it can be quad on the other but there is no multilateral system uh, that you know uh, the, the robustness of the global multilateral order is being questioned and therefore we are looking at new uh, platforms emerging but they are not multilateral in their orientation and multilateralism mm -hmm. is the need of the hour whether you look at security issues whether you look at health issues so i think the question is how do you generate that consensus and i'm afraid i don't see an easy way out of generating that consensus amongst the plethora of major powers that are there in terms of the direction that we need to go in for reforms there are okay. many reports there are many recommendations but i don't think the path is very clear at the moment Okay. Okay. Uh, consensus obviously is uh, the key here. And uh, uh, Mr. Sena, you know, uh, given the inherent contradictions within these multilateral organizations, and also within these regional blocks, uh, which are asking for these reforms, as Professor Pant was pointing out, you know, for example, if we look at BRICS itself, uh, you have two uh, permanent security council members, uh, and uh, obviously China would not want uh, India to be, uh, you know, as as one of the uh, uh, permanent members of the security council. Uh, something which india has uh, uh, been seeking for quite some time so how to you know move ahead with these contradictions again the larger question the big question where to begin because uh, achieving a consensus uh, at, at you know in in such a contradictory environment might be really really difficult well yes i totally agree with professor pant that uh, it's one doesn't really know where to begin now uh, brics for example let's take this example now, when BRICS was set up, India had placed very high hopes on BRICS 15 years ago that BRICS would be the vehicle for promoting a more multipolar world. But what we have seen happen is that one of the members of BRICS, specifically China, has now become a superpower. And if you look at China's behavior in the international order, you find that China is behaving exactly the same way as a dominant uh, power used to behave earlier. Uh, for example, uh, whether uh, China does China believe in a multipolar world? If you look at there are 15 specialized agencies and China, a Chinese heads four of these. Now, this is unprecedented in UN history. Uh, international law, uh, Philippines took China to uh, on the SCS disputes, South China Sea dispute, mm -hmm. and there was a arbitration and China refused to honor that arbitration award. So uh, then you have other examples of, of Chinese uh, domination. So you have a situation where the BRICS as a forum uh, for uh, promoting a multipolar world is clearly not not uh, doesn't hold any hope at all now. The other problem that we face is that in the earlier Cold War situation where you had a bipolar world, mm -hmm. you had the Soviet Union at the US, India could afford to be non-aligned there because we had no basic differences with either side. So we could cooperate with one side and the other on issue-based uh, matters. And then we could uh, also try and promote to be a bridge between those two uh, camps. Today, with, with China emerging as one of the poles in this, we find that we have a 
a, a, a rather adversarial relationship, in fact, a hostile relationship in many areas. We have clearly national security concerns with China. So we have to also look at those concerns. And in that respect, we have to start cooperating with other groups of countries, for example, Quad that we have become members of. And uh, that, that security concern is the paramount concern today. So as a matter of fact, we have to look at this uh, form of cooperation first before we try and look at any other form of cooperation to look at uh, a more multipolar world. Okay. Okay. Professor Pant, with, with so many contradictions, you know, both of you are pointing out and then specifically if you're looking at uh, emerging powers uh, like China out there and they being uh, uh, the, the root cause of the problem at, at various levels in these multilateral institutions as well. And uh, how do you see a, a sort of a, you know, a way out of this, this, this conundrum, if I may call it? I think you know what Ambassador Sinha was pointing out uh, in his statement is 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 fairly. It seems to me that that's that's the way countries are moving, because the multilateral order is fraying at the edges. Uh, you find that countries, including India, are now relying more and more on uh, you know issue-based coalitions, which are primarily minilateral in their orientation. So you see this, you know, the, the emergence of Quad, for example. What 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 what's the biggest problem in the Indo-Pacific today? The problem is that Indo-Pacific, as a uh, you know, as a, a, a emerging geography, as an emerging geography, lacks any institutional mechanism. Now. There are, there, there are two options. One, you keep on waiting for a multilateral order in the Indo-Pacific to emerge, or you start working with like-minded countries to construct a nucleus around which something possibly at a certain point in time, uh, something may emerge in a, at a later date, which can which which is seemingly more multilateral. So I think the minilateral route seems to be uh, the, the, the point that, uh, that uh, countries are taking, because at a global level, uh, the fractures are becoming very, very vivid, very, very categorical. So you, you see what is happening in the UN Security Council today. It is at an impasse on most issues, and it is, you know, compared to what it was during the Cold War. Today, now, China and the Russians on the one side and the Western countries on the other are completely making uh, a joke of the UN Security Council because it's paralyzed. So what are the, what are the options for countries like India that needs... Uh, in international structures to work that needs multilateral institutions to work. So if they are not working, then you go in for other options, which is like, okay. uh, you know, what what we were what we have been discussing, like like quad like structures that can be created on an ad hoc basis, uh, perhaps with a, with a, with an idea that they can be uh, made more robust over a period of time. But unfortunately, that is not going to solve our global problems. Like, what do you do when a health crisis strikes, like the one that that we are witnessing today? If WHO is not working then what do you do? You can't create ad hoc coalitions uh, on public health, uh, you know, on a, in a jiffy. So I think the challenge, therefore, is that as our, as global problems are mounting, the multilateral order is, is certainly not able to come to terms with that. And the, and the countries that actually need that kind of support uh, are, uh, are the worst uh, sufferers at the moment. Okay. Professor, uh, uh, Mr. Sinha, rather, you know, uh, would you agree with uh, what Professor Pant is saying that minilateral... Uh, uh, arrangements, minilateral ad hoc uh, arrangements might be the way out in the shorter run uh, when the, you know, the, the multilateral institutions doesn't seem to be functioning the way they should be or, uh, you know, not all the parties have the desired results out there at the international forum. But in the long run, uh, you know, you'll have to come back to the multilateral institutions and can these minilateral, uh, you know, ad hoc arrangements force those other nations or those other powers to come to that consensus which we initially started talking about that consensus is the way forward well that is the ideal situation but uh, given the present situation uh, we have to be realistic we have to understand that uh, the security council is at an impasse because of its structure and it was created as a very deliberate uh, manner because the big powers at that time in 1945 realized that unless they acted in unison there would be a, a war bit among them and there'd be a world war again. So to avoid that, they felt that the Security Council should act only when all the permanent five are in concurrence with the idea of taking military action. Mm -hmm. Now, that didn't happen except in a very brief period in the 1990s. And that, of course, we have had our bad experience with that. Uh, but the other multilateral organizations, like, for example, the WTO, which worked broadly on a basis of consensus, are not able to reach consensus. For the last for 20, 25 years, the WTO has only been discussing its agenda, what to discuss. 
it has not come to any agreement any new idea uh, there are other organizations which are dominated by multinational corporations by big money or by big donors so all these things lead to a position where we find that because of the fact that today in international organizations there is not enough global consensus and you need global consensus to be able to act today we have to willy nilly go back to a uh, mini natural as as professor pansa says very accurately to smaller organizations so that we at least cooperate meaningfully among a smaller group of countries of like minded countries and then hope that uh, later on when the time changes we'll be able to do it on a global scale but in our present situation both for trade and economic reasons where we can go for uh, ftas with uh, like minded countries or in security matters we can go for again for like minded country groups like quad for example uh, because that is the way forward for the present okay okay but but uh, again you know the the one major question here and i'd like to uh, start with you professor panth here on this uh, because uh, even in this joint statement also a reference has been made to the covid-19 pandemic and this pandemic has once again made it very clear the need for reforms at this multilateral institutions specifically institutions like wto and who the case uh, of handling uh, of of covid-19 pandemic is is uh, you know a uh, pretty much uh, the issue here in wto for example if we uh, if we, if we look at there the proposal which has been made by india and south africa uh, for relaxation with a with you know uh, the equipments and drugs related to covid-19 uh, it has been almost a year the proposal is still pending so so the lack of consensus is something which is not allowing these crucial proposals or crucial you know suggestions like these to be taken up or to be acted upon Uh, yes vishal i think you know sometimes we also give too much uh, you know uh, credit to international institutions in some ways because international institutions uh, are also reflective of a larger power reality in the international structure right so if you were if you are for example uh, if you have today two powers that are structurally colliding with each other and these are two world views right you have china on the one hand and america on the other or west on the other now they do not see eye to eye on any damn thing so the question is even on public health you are you are you know uh, we are now at, at one point we were told that look this is a new functionalist situation right health is the easiest subject to collaborate on there are no security concerns there is no uh, up one up manship it's a cooperative security framework today that uh, health even is becoming securitized to an extent where china has done something which china refuses to become be transparent about and on the other hand there is a large clamor for greater to to know actually what is the origin of this virus because unless we know that we won't be able to treat it properly we won't be able to protect ourselves in the future so the question i think on both sides is are, the, the debate is becoming polarized because the larger power reality is polarized china and america do not see eye to eye china wants to become the top dog in the international system america is preventing it to do so so the so the onus is uh, and the axe therefore falls on international institutions they will not work unless the power configuration is such that it can generate that kind of consensus that we are talking about unfortunately uh, that power uh, that you know that power configuration does not exist today that consensus therefore is elusive so the okay. challenge for countries like india for countries for example that you talked about trips waiver and african countries is how do you convince uh, you know these these powers that look there is some there is something of benefit to the larger global community if you come together especially on issues like health so uh, you know america uh, for all its uh, you know uh, debates within the america america is now committing itself Uh, to the resolution that india and south africa have brought uh, in the wto but again there are there is big pharma there there is uh, uh, there are europeans who are not uh, convinced uh, about the uh, you know the, the possibility of that to happen so i think that the fault lines are still there which have which are to be nurtured so in in that in that context my my sense is that if you look at at an organization like w who or wto they have become so politicized partly because the global politics has become much more fractious and much more antagonistic and that is being reflected in our international institutions so okay. unless the fundamental reality of power politics changes my sense is that increasingly we will see countries 
uh, moving away from this multilateral order, although in rhetoric we will continue to say multilateralism uh, is the way to go, but because it, it, it's not working and it's unrealistic of countries to think that it will work given the present power structures, I think they will go for other kinds of avenues which we have been discussing. Okay, okay. And Mr. Sena, would you agree that, you know, as uh, Professor Pant is saying, uh, ultimately the onus lies on, on the member nations here because these international bodies, uh, these multilateral institutions are, are comprised of, uh, you know, all the nations and specifically the ones which are better placed. Uh, for example, when we talk about UN Security Council, uh, you know, those uh, uh, members were the, were the permanent, uh, uh, those nations were the permanent members in the in UNSC. Same uh, goes for other nations, uh, you know, other, other bodies as well. Yes, these international organizations are actually intergovernmental organizations. The governments sit there and they are the directors of this organization. The secretariat is just the staff that services these, uh, the general assembly of these, uh, uh, of these organizations. So it is for the governments to take a decision. And the tradition in most of these organizations is uh, to work on the basis of consensus. Now, in the good old days when the West used to dominate these, they introduced practices like, for example, placing their own staff as, uh, as they are called voluntary experts. And then they had uh, things like extra budgetary resources would be given to enable these organizations to function according to what the donors wanted. Now, this was the game that Western countries played. And in those days, we opposed those countries because we wanted these international organizations to, to get an international character and to function according to multilateral goals. Now, what happened in the meanwhile, in the last 10 years, is that China has learned this game and China is playing this game far more viciously than the West ever did. So China today, as I said, dominates, tries to dominate the international organizations, tries to bully them, tries to even bribe them. There have been specific cases of international civil servants being bribed by China. Mm -hmm. So you have this very peculiar situation where we are confronted with a country with which we used to cooperate earlier in organizations like BRICS and BASIC and other places, uh, which is behaving the same way as we had what we had opposed when we were in these organizations. So we have to chalk our way forward. And in the midst of all these, we have security concerns as well, which is clearly most predominant uh, security, both in terms of health and in terms of military security. So we have to look at all this and we have to, I think for the moment, look at the short term goals rather than worry about the larger uh, issue of multilateral order and international organizations. Okay, okay. Quick conclusion comments from you, Professor Pant, and it looks like, you know, this is going to be a long drawn uh, uh, battle ahead in terms of, you know, bringing in reforms uh, to these multilateral institutions, because this is an idea which we've been talking for about, uh, uh, for, all, you know, uh, quite a number of years now. Uh, yes, I, I think so. You know, it's going to be a long drawn process. And, and what, what we have seen is, you know, also a shift in India's stance, for example, if uh, if you were, uh, you know, if you uh, go back to Prime Minister Modi's speech last year to the UN General Assembly, where he, you know, he was, I think, uh, uh, resonating a lot of the sentiment that is prevalent in India at the moment is that, look, we are a country of so many billions and we are a country, you know, we, we are doing well economically. And yet we are struggling in, in, in making a case to the world that we should be there. Why should it be the case? Why is it that the UN or, or an organization like the UN not look at a country like India and say, well, it has to be there and therefore help uh, in, in, you know, in that evolution? So mm -hmm. I think the question that he posed was that it's the re relevance of the UN that is at stake, not the, uh, you know, not the fact that India is there or not. India eventually is part of all global governance conversations, whether it is U a part of UN Security Council or not. But the question, I think, is at the moment, the credibility of the multilateral structure is at stake which I think is the fundamental issue. And therefore, when, you're cre when the credibility is going down, countries are find finding other via media to, to talk of governance issues, which, are, which, is, which, which is clearly needed. But I think now we are moving to domain-specific governance, where like-minded countries joining forces perhaps is going to be the norm for the foreseeable future, because that's the direction global politics seems to be uh, moving forward. Okay, there it is. Uh, looks like uh, it is uh, indeed going to be a long drawn out process, uh, given the fact that there are uh, quite a number of stakeholders. Uh, and obviously, this is a particular issue which has been in the public domain being debated for uh, quite some time now. Thank you so much, Professor Ashwi Pant and Ambassador Dalip Sinai as well for sharing your views and insights uh, on this issue of uh, need for reforms in the multilateral institutions and how to bring about those reforms uh, on the ground. We'll come back again with a different topic. Till then, keep watching. Thank you.